First, I'll start recording. This is lecture number five for uh, Math 140 Business on um, September 14th. And we have a question that has been proposed for uh, um, uh, this question here. How well have stocks done over the past generation? They give you 42 data points and they ask you to compute a bunch of stuff. Now I clicked on the data set and it took me to this page right here. Mac text, PC text, Excel, JMP, Minitab, SBSS, or a TI calculator. Now the TI calculator, uh-oh, what did that do? Okay, never mind that. Okay, that's a bad one. Let's do um, Excel. Let's see, can I open Excel? Because otherwise I gotta do this, uh, by hand, which was really horrible. I don't do that by hand. Oh, okay, look at this. So we have Excel. So here are all my data points, right? So I'm gonna do equals stdev, and then I'm going to do that. And I get 18.0577. I mean, I don't need all the decimals there, but uh, that's my answer. Does that make sense? Uh, so the answer is 18.05? Well, 06. 06, okay. All right, thank you. I mean, but wait, 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 wait. That's my data set. You don't necessarily have the same numbers that I do. So they might give you different numbers. But that's how you can compute it. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, I got the same answer, though, but it says it's wrong. Uh, again, your numbers might not be my numbers. So your, what do you mean you got the same answer? Like you did, you did the same thing I did with your data set? Last night. Sorry? Um, yeah, it's, it's not, I don't know if it's the same data set, but it's, I got 18.7, 18.07. I'm, I'm just letting you know. Uh, what do you mean you got, be more specific. What do you mean you got 18.07? Number eight for standard deviation, I got 18.07. By, by doing what is what I mean? Um, I inputted all these numbers. Okay. Into what? StackCrunch. Okay. In StackCrunch. Okay. And it, and it gave you that answer? Yeah. I and mean, it, said, it said it was wrong? I mean, the, the whole, I mean, the question is wrong. It just gives me an X. It's not telling me what's wrong. I understand. Oh, 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 I see. So, okay. What, what are your other values that you have? What do you have for the mean? Mean was 11.68. Okay. Standard deviation was what? 18.07. Okay. What do you have for the min? Uh, negative 37.23. What do you have for the Q1? 1.37. Well, that's not right. What's the median? Uh, 15.92. What's Q3? 31.47. That's not right. And what's the max? 37.38. Okay, so your Q1 and Q3 are wrong. So tell me, forget about SD dev. How do you get your Q1 and Q3? Uh, what I did was, uh, I think I found the, the top 11, uh, or the lowest, like the top 11 lowest numbers? Well, let's take a look. There's 42 data points altogether, correct? Yes. So 42 data points means that the, med that the Q2 would be between the 21st and the 22nd, right? Yes. So if I look at the first 27 data points, sorry, the first 21 data points, Q1 would be the 11th. Yes. Okay, so we want the 11th data point. And you got one point something you said? Yes. Okay, well, I mean, I see the answer. Did anyone get this right, by the way? Because it could be the computer is wrong. But let's take a look. I'll look at the smallest 11 that I have here. So I'm looking at the smallest 11. Uh, of course, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine negatives. So the eleventh will be the second smallest positive number. 
What is the second smallest positive number? Second smallest positive number? Yeah. Um, 0 0.06. Uh, it looks like 0 0.98. It looks like 0 0.98, which is not what they have here. Oh, so, okay. No, no, I agree with you. It should be 0 0.9, negative 0.98. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah, the second smallest positive number should be 0.98, unless I'm missing something here. Yeah, I know, I get, I, I see it as 0.98. So your original number is certainly wrong, but I wonder if I can do a quartile. Yeah, quartile. Let's see what happens with quartile now. So let's, how do I do a quartile? Quartile, let's take a look. How do I, I'm going to share again to show you what I'm doing here so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so I put in, I'll do it again. So I did equals quartile, but I don't know what it wants here. Okay, I need the data set and I need the quartile number. So first quartile and the data set. I don't, yeah, there we go. Okay, let's see what it gives me. So it gives me 1.1725. Wow, okay. And the same data sets for the second quartile. 15, is that what we got? 15.915 for the median? 15.92. Okay, yeah, okay, close enough. And then Again, equals quartile. So you see here, there's a quartile function, which is nice because all you have to do is put everything in and tell it which quartile you want. Okay, so according to this, it's those three numbers. Um, I mean, uh, I would write out the numbers in order from lowest to highest and, uh, and confirm that. But just by looking, there's certainly 42 data points uh, I wonder, is there like an order? Can I, is there like an order? No. Anyone know of an Excel command that can maybe sort? No, no sorry. Um, is there a sort command? So a um, chronological command? No, I don't know. Uh, let's see, statistical. Um, what can I do here? What looks like it might be a way of putting them in order. Um, I don't see anything that stands out. Maybe numeric. Um, do you want like chronological order or? Yeah, like lowest to highest. Um, I remember I took IS. Give me one second. I have it on my notes. Sure, that'd be great. You did. There's like a button where you just like say it's just a sort, and then it just sorts it for you. But a sort, not not just sort, but a sort. Got it. No, so just a sort, but you had to open like the actual like Excel. Oh. Yeah, I don't know how it works on that one, but if you open like the actual like Excel, it's under like, data. So yeah, under Excel, it's under data and it has sort and it should tell you however you want it sorted. It should probably be on the far top where it says um, like numbers, file, edit, insert, table, organize on the very, very far top. It'll probably give you an option. Um, Format. Uh oh. That is so strange. Show sort options. Sort entire, okay, wait, 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 wait. Filter probably. Sort, sort. You probably had to highlight, yeah. Sort. 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 That's strange, it does not give you the option. Hmm. I don't know, I, okay. I, I don't know, uh, I do know one thing. I know that if you do it on your um, calculator, 
Uh, I know it's a lot of work to put in all the numbers, but it will give you Q1, Q2, Q3. Um, so I, I, I don't know. It could be a problem with the program. Uh, I'll look at it. Uh, let me make a note so I can do this later. This is homework two, number eight. You said right. Okay, so I will. I'm already 15 minutes in. I don't want to. I don't want to spend too much more time on this or anything more time on this. So uh, I'll try to figure it out. And maybe it's wrong. Uh, anyways, Nelson, you're here. I see you. I will mark you as um, late. Okay. Are there any other questions you guys want to go over them? Oh, thank you, Professor. Okay. Sorry, I would like to have gotten a definitive answer, but uh, it didn't happen. Yes? Professor, can we go over one more question? Uh, if it's quick, which one? Yeah, it's number 14. Number 14. Um, okay. Uh, number 14. This is a standard deviation contest. You must choose four numbers from the whole numbers 30 to 98 with repeats allowed. So hold on, let me share my iPad here. Oh, um, I got I got 24, 24, 62, 62. I don't oh, know. Wow, I haven't read the question yet. One second, one second. Oh, sorry. You're you're uh, you're, you're uh, robbing me of the opportunity to try it myself. Well, let's take a look. Okay, so um, so choose so this is now homework number two number four number what number was this 14 and yep. so one is uh, um, check online okay so you must choose four numbers from 30 to 98 30 to 98 uh, repeats allowed and it says choose four numbers that have the largest possible standard deviation. That means we want the spread to be as large as possible. Why not just take 30 twice and 98 twice? Wouldn't that give you the highest spread possible? Yes. Yeah. That seems to me what you should do, right? Have two on the far left, two on the far right. If you did three on one side and one on the other, these three are really tight and you only have one that's far away. But by having two and two, you have, a, it'll be a greater spread. So um, yeah, that's what I would do. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. That's, that's what yeah, I would do. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. All right. So let us now, if there's no more questions, jump ahead to the very important chapter three. Chapter three is where it gets fun. The first two chapters were uh, important, but at the same time, they were not very mathematical. Yes, we did a little math in the last chapter, calculating a mean, calculating center deviation, calculating the median, but you know, this is math, right? We wanna do some math. So chapter three, Everyone loves math. They might say they don't, but they're lying. We all know this. Chapter three is on the normal distribution. The normal distribution. What exactly is a normal distribution? Well, what the hell is a distribution in the first place? I'm glad you asked. It's a great question. So to illustrate this, I am actually going to share something online. So let me uh, load up this thing online. And you should really pay attention to this because it's really important. Um, and it's all, it's kind of fun too. Okay. I mean, you know, I think so. Okay. So later in the course, we're going to talk about something called the central limit theorem, which is what this app is all about. But for now, let's not worry about that. We don't need the central limit theorem for this. I want you to consider the following situation. This guy here, this number one, this red curve. I know the whole thing is red, but I really only really focus on the top part. This red curve is flat. 
from the left side to the right side. The left side representing zero and the right side representing 100. If I randomly picked numbers from zero to 100, where each number was as equally likely to be chosen as any other number, which is what this flat curve represents, the likelihood of each number, then how many of each number do you expect me to get? Let's say I do 100,000 choices, 100,000 random digits that I pick from 100 to, 1, to 0 to 100. How many of each do you think I would get? Approximately. A thousand? Roughly a thousand, right? Yes. Now, do you expect me to get exactly the same number of each? Uh, no, but like similar. Well, let's see what happens. I'm actually going to do it. So this is a histogram representing an actual scenario where this computer, my computer, generated 103,303 random choices from zero to 100, where each number was as equally likely to be chosen as any other number. And this is the histogram that resulted. Does this seem realistic? Yeah. If we did it again, do you think I get exactly the same curve, the same shape? No. No, we'll let's do it again and see. It should be ballpark similar though, right? That seems reasonable. Uh, yeah, just not exactly the same. With like not exactly the same. I mean, we didn't even have the same number of choices, right? This number is different. And it looks fairly similar, but not exactly the same, right? Yes. What if we did like a really weird looking one, like number three? This says you're very likely to pick a small number you're somewhat likely to pick a big number, and you're very unlikely to pick a number here in the middle. If I did roughly 100,000 picks, what would my histogram look like? Like number three? Like, like, num like number three, right? This is the whole point of this applet, is that if you have a, one of these eight shapes, then if you perform this, this, this picking roughly 100,000 times, you should have something that looks like the shape. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Now, each shape here is a histogram because it's an actual experiment that my computer did to generate outcomes. These shapes, are the underlying distributions. They're the idealized perfect scenario based upon math and not an actual experiment. This one, number one, is the underlying scenario where every number is as equally likely as any other number. Each one of these is called a distribution because it is a idealized model representing a future histogram that comes from an actual performance of an experiment. It's the difference between a distribution and the histogram. The histogram requires actual data. The distribution is theory. In theory, if every number is as equally likely as the rest, it should look like this. In theory, I might have something like two or three, or four, or five, six, seven, eight. Let's think about three. Can anyone think of a real life scenario where small numbers between zero and 20 are very likely, 20 to 60 are not so likely, and 60 to 100 are somewhere in between. Can anyone think of a real life scenario that might be represented by such a shape? I don't know about shape, but this looks similar to the skewed left or the skewed right. Yeah, um, this one is certainly skewed right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's peaked and tails off to the right. But I'm looking for an actual real life situation where you don't know the outcome in advance, but you expect small numbers to occur lots of times 
big numbers to occur not as much, but more than the middle numbers. Can anyone think of a real life scenario that would have something like this? I, I have an idea. The lottery? The lottery? What do you mean by the lottery? Why, why, wait, wait, if, wait, if it's a lottery, wouldn't you think every number is an equal likely chance to be chosen? That I do not know. Uh, the age of people not working. The age of people. So if I pick a random person and I say, what is the likelihood that the person is not working? Chances are from zero to 20, it's very high the person is not working. After 60, it's less likely that they're not working. But 20 to 40, it's very unlikely that they're not working. That's, that's a pretty good one, isn't it? Kids don't work, older people are retired, but middle aged, we're all working. How about like gambling, playing in a cas casino, your chances of winning? So, but what, what are the numbers from zero to 100 represent? Your chances of winning? No, but they have to, we're talking about something like, so you're saying it's very likely to win zero or one or two to 20 somewhat likely to win 60 to 100 but very unlikely to win 20 to 60. that would be your 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 guess here is is that scenario you see what i'm saying yeah yeah i got you i got you so my i mean first of all i love that example by the way of of, of not working because it's very unlikely that people who are 20 to 60 are not working because most of us our, our, we can't just retire early. We don't have trust funds. We got to work. So very unlikely. Kids, very unlikely that you're working because they're in school. They're having a good time, right? Why would they be working? But once you pass 60, you're retired for the most part. But a lot of people who are old still work. They, they, they consult. They, maybe they didn't make enough. They still need to work. Um, I, I think it's fairly nice. I mean, at 100 years old, to have as many working as 60, I think might be a little bit of a stretch. But at least it's ballpark. Uh, my guess personally was something like um, doctor visits per year, or you know how how likely is it the person saw the doctor that year? Uh, you know, kids are very likely to see the doctor, especially when you're when you're very young because you're getting shots and you're getting checkups and you're seeing all that stuff. And then twenty to sixty, I mean, man, I haven't had a physical in however many years. I don't know. So I don't know, it's just a thought. I, there's no one answer to something like this, but it's just the idea that there's scenarios out there that might correspond to one distribution over a different distribution. Does that make sense? Does it, does it, yes, guys, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Of these eight, which is the most famous distribution? Anyone know of these eight, which one is the most famous? Number five. Number five, what is number five? What do we call that? Isn't it a bell curve? It's a bell curve. And the bell curve has another name. It is called the normal distribution. So this whole chapter, when it talks about the normal distribution, it is talking about what is commonly called a bell curve. So, First, let's talk about what a distribution is, and then we'll get into details specifically of the normal distribution. So a distribution is an idealized model representing possible outcomes on the x-axis and relative likelihoods on the y-axis. It is not based upon a specific experiment. It is based upon purely a model. I believe that this real life scenario could be governed by this shape where here where the graph is really tall, I have a lot of likelihood of having an outcome. And here where the graph is low, I have a low likelihood of having an outcome. 
and then maybe it's a good model, maybe it's not a good model. Let me perform an experiment and see if my outcomes agree with the model. If they do, then I'll be like, hey, that's a great model. If they don't, it's probably not a good model. Okay, but it's certainly a starting point. And there are some very famous models out there, the normal distribution being one of them. We're gonna learn about a few, maybe, I don't know, four or five in the course, maybe less. Uh, um, certainly the normal, the student's T, the F, the chi-square distribution, maybe the geometric, the binomial. So there's different distributions that we're gonna do. Now, related to a distribution is called a density curve. They kind of come, they kind of go together, distributions and density curves. A density curve is a curve that has two properties. One is always on or above the x-axis. And two has an area of one exactly beneath it. What's the word right before likelihoods? Uh, relative, relative likelihoods. Relative, sorry. I could write meter, but um, I just don't. Sorry, but always feel free to 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 interrupt me if you if you don't uh, 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 recognize a word or something. So a density curve, a density curve describes the overall pattern of the distribution. That is what it does. So for example, the normal. Notice how the normal is always above the x-axis. First of all, can someone explain to me uh, why the normal or why any curve, density curve, must be above the x-axis? Because density can't be a negative. Uh, why not? Because it has to be something. Like, there has to be a density. Yeah, in a sense, but I, but, but I want you to be a little more precise. The density, the curve, represents likelihoods. Right here in the middle, where the curve is high, it's very likely to occur. Here on the ends, it's very unlikely to occur. But what would a graph beneath the x-axis physically represent? That it's negatively likely to occur? Non-existent. Uh, yeah, that doesn't, well, non-existent means zero, right? If it hits the x-axis, it can occur. You can't get any less likely than not occurring, right? If there's no way that it can occur, that's the x-axis, that's zero. You can't get beneath that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, now what's the reason why the area under the curve should be exactly one? Does that have to do with percentages? In what, in what way? Like, so there's a, like, let's say there's like a hundred people, like you have a hundred different answers and you just put it on the graph. So that'd be equal to one. What if it was a thousand answers or 17 answers or 26 answers? Uh, it it has to be, it's always going to be equal to one, no matter the amount of people. It just has to. Yeah. Oh, are we done? I thought you were. I thought you were continuing. I'm sorry. I was waiting. Yeah, sorry. Like it's. Uh, it's hard to. It's, like yeah. I'm not too sure. Well, I know sometimes like we have an intuitive idea of something and it's hard to put into words. Um, but yeah, it's because of the following. Remember, the histograms 
are the realizations of the, of the distributions, correct? If I actually perform the experiment, I have the histogram. I know that the histogram, if I add up all the rectangles of a histogram, it has to be 100% because every outcome has to be somewhere, correct? Yeah. So the density curve is an idealized model of the histogram, of a perfect histogram in a sense, where it gives me the exact right amount for each possible outcome. And if I add up the exact right amounts of all the outcomes, it should still add to what's to 100%. So we translate that to a continuous curve by requiring that the area under it also be exactly 100% or just the number one. Does that make sense? Yes. Anahi, was that what you were trying to say? Yeah. Okay, is it because it's one whole? All right, so, well, I, I didn't see that, so I apologize that I, that I, I didn't quite understand your, your meaning, but hopefully you understand mine. Yeah, yeah, I do, thank you. Okay, sir. all right, I forgive you. Okay, now, we know that if you have a, um, if you have a histogram that looks like this, that does not mean that you know, someone's giving you the finger, although it kind of looks like that, which is kind of awesome. But what shape would we assign to a histogram like this? Symmetric, left skewed, or right skewed? Probably symmetric. Well, I made it that way, right? I tried to make it really symmetric. So now what happens if I have a distribution that looks like that? What shape would I assign to this distribution? Wait, what would you describe to it, my bad? How would I describe it? If I had to, if I had to give this guy a shape. Oh, a shape. I would also say it's symmetric. Yeah, why not? Symmetric still works, All right? It's still symmetric. It still is a mirror image across its center. So even though this is not a histogram, it did not come from actual data, I can still use the same description and call it symmetric. And if I had a histogram that was right skewed or a distribution that's right skewed, right? I can still call it right skewed, even though it does not come from actual data. Where is the mode, the median, the mean, for let's say a right skewed distribution. Does that even make sense, the mode? I mean, you don't have actual data, so you don't have anything that occurred the most times. How do you have a mode when it comes to a distribution? How do you have a mean? A mean is the average of all your outcomes. You don't have any outcomes. How do you have a median? The median is the middle of all your outcomes. You don't have any outcomes. So how do we take mode, median, and mean, which made a lot of sense for histograms, and translate it to distributions. So the answer is the mode is still, or is gonna be the point with the most likely outcome. It's gonna be the highest point on the curve. The mode is no longer the point that occurred the most times, but rather it's the point that should occur the most times because it is the most likely outcome for any one particular experiment. How about the mean or the median? What should the median be? Let's do that one first. In the case of a histogram, the median was the middle point of all of your data. You don't have any data here. So how should we define the median? The same way. Well, we don't have any data. How can we do the same way? Just take the middle like, of the graph. Well, what do you mean by the middle of the graph? Do you mean divide it into equal parts and call the median right there? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Ah, OK. Well, it's a, it's a, that's wrong. But it's a good guess. I like, the, I, I like guessing. I do. <laughs> yeah, well, better that than absolute silence. Then I just wonder what, you know, if anyone's paying attention. Uh, where the percentage is like 
could be equal on both sides. Yes. So we know we know that the total area under the curve is 100%. So the point at which the total area would be 50% is going to be the point of our median. Now, with a skew to the right graph, that median is going to be somewhat to the right of the peak, but probably not that much because it's taller on the left and longer on the right, it's going to be some kind of balance. Now, I'm not the greatest artist in the world. I'm not the greatest at seeing percentages. If you feel that 50% is a little to the right or left, you, you know, feel free, of course, to, to adjust. Does that, make, does that make sense, though? Yes. For a, for a good choice for what the median should be? Anahit, what do you think? Huh? You agree with that? Yeah. 50% on left, 50% on right, right? It's the point at which half of the distribution is on each side. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. So the next question is what about the mean? What should the mean be? A little to the right. I'm sorry, say it again, please. Uh, like a little to the right of the median. 100%, because we know that the mean is pulled more to the right than the median, but what should be the physical? I mean, like, it, without actual data, how can I determine what the mean is? So the answer here is actually the same way as with the histogram. Because remember, with the histogram, what was the mean? It was the physical balance point. It was the point at which you could put your finger under the histogram and it would balance left and right without tipping. I can still do that with a continuous curve. So the mean, which is pulled a little further to the right than the median, is again the balance point. Now, luckily, there's a mathematical way of finding the mean and a mathematical way of finding the median and a mathematical way of finding the mode for any distribution. Unluckily, they require calculus. So we oh, will yeah. only be doing it in special cases, huh? Oh yeah, I think I know. Is that the, does that have to do with integrals and stuff? Uh, the, like the, the derivatives? So the mode is a derivative because if I find where the derivative is equal to zero, that's gonna be the peak. So I can find the mode with derivatives. The median is with an integral because the area to the left should be equal to uh, 0.5. And the mean is also with integrals, um, but for a different reason that we'll get to when we have a formula later in the, in the, in the book. Okay. So uh, all three of them require calculus or your calculator. And luckily, while this is not a calculus-based course, it is a calculator-based course, which means we will learn how to use your calculator to compute some of those things. But for now, the point is, is that we can transfer over the ideas of mode, median, and mean from a histogram where you actually have a mode and a median and a mean to a distribution where it's more theoretical, but it's still well-defined. Are there any questions on that so far? No. Okay. So now let's get to specifically the normal distribution. And the normal distribution is your standard bell curve. So the normal distribution looks something like that. It goes forever in both directions and never ends. You might ask, how can I have an area of one under a curve that goes forever to the left and forever to the right. And again, the answer to that is with calculus. Um, one of the deficiencies of statistics, not deficiencies, but one of the problems with statistics and teaching statistics in particular is so many of the justifications for what we learn come from calculus. So that a lot of times it's just accept it and go with it sorry but i can't tell you why and some of us some of you myself in particular i love knowing why um 
things are true. It helps me understand them, helps me remember them, help me use them properly. And in statistics, just quite often, we just don't have it. Um, and this is an example of them. So it can be done, but we're not going to do it. Okay. So for a normal distribution, where is the mean located? The middle. Right in the middle. So the peak is actually three things at once. It is the mode, because it's the highest point. It is the median, because 50% is to the left and 50% is to the right. And it is also the mean, because it is the physical balance points. In fact, how many different normal distributions are there in the universe? There's infinitely many. Um, I might draw one that's a little skinnier. I might draw one centered somewhere else. But every one of them is uniquely determined. So a normal distribution is uniquely determined by providing two parameters. If you give me two numbers, two physical numbers, because they have to represent something physically. If you give me two physical numbers, I will know exactly which of the infinitely many normals we're talking about. One of them is the Anyone? One of them is the? Anyone take a guess? 50, 50? No, no. What I mean is. <laughs> I was thinking of cosine and sine. No, 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 no. And I wasn't trying to, to, to denigrate that. So yeah. Not what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> give me an example of a normal curve out there in the world. Anyone know of any normal curve out there in the world? A situation that's modeled by a normal? Anyone? Temperature? What do you mean by that? Like, um, what do I mean by that? Like seasons, you know how like certain seasons, even the global warming, but like you, traditionally typical seasons have like peaks in temperature and like valleys. Okay, so, so temperatures, um, in the summer, for example, most of the time, the temperatures will be around a certain value. And as you go far to the left and right, it becomes very unlikely. Right? So like if, if the average temperature, I'm in Van Nuys, right? That's where I live. So if the average temperature in, in the summer is, let's say, 100 degrees, most days are going to be around 100. And very few are going to be past 90 or past 110. Correct? Does that seem reasonable? Yes. So what is the mean in that example that I just gave you? The 100. Oh, 100, because it's centered at 100. Can you imagine other normals that are not centered at 100 out there in the world? Like temperature-wise? No, like anything. Another, oh. another example where the mean is not 100. Maybe income? Income, OK. I don't know if income would necessarily be normally distributed, but assuming it is, the average income is certainly not $100, correct? Yes. So the first number that can help us uniquely determine which normal we're talking about is the mean. When you provide the mean, which is given by the Greek letter mu, it's um, the sound that a French cow makes. When you give me the mean, I've at least know where the center of my normal is. So out of all the possible normals that I can be looking at, I now know where it's centered. But even if it's centered in the same location as a different one, it can still differ because of a second parameter, a second piece of information that you must provide before I know precisely which normal we're talking about. Can anyone guess what the second parameter would be? The second piece of information so I know exactly which normal we're talking about. What besides the mean, which is the center, must you provide for me 
for me to median. know which one? The median. Well, the mean and the median are the same for the normal, right? Then we already established that they're all the same. So if you give me one, you just gave me the other. I need a I need an independent quantity. Like, like the portion. What do you mean by that? Like the amount. What do you mean by that? Um. Never mind. The starting point and end point. Well, but it goes forever in both directions. Oh, okay. So there is no starting point and end point. So the answer is the. The spread? The standard deviation, which as we learned in the last chapter, always goes along with the mean. What does the standard deviation tell us? How spread out the, the normal is? Is it sharp? And therefore it's not spread out very much? Or is it wider? So it is spread out. If you tell me where it's centered and how it's spread out, you will have uniquely determined the normal that we're talking about. Now, finding the mean is easy. I just have to look for where the graph is centered. How do I find the standard deviation? Now, I'm not expecting you to guess this, so I will explain it. In the center of the curve, would you describe it, if you were to choose between looking like a hill or looking like a bowl, if you had to give it one of those two characterizations, which one would you pick, a hill or a bowl in the center of the graph? Hill. It yeah. certainly looks like a hill, correct? If you had to pick one, it certainly looks like a hill, right? If you go to the far right or far left of the graph, and you had to give it a characterization as either a hill or a bowl, or a portion of a hill or a portion of a bowl, which would you pick? Portion of a bowl. Portion of a bowl, right? It's more, it's more curving that way versus curving that way. Do we agree? Yes. All right. I would like you now to pick with the best of your vision to pick the specific point that you can literally say right there on the graph where it changes from looking more like a hill to looking more like a bowl. I'll give you some choices. Okay, I just drew some random points. I drew one, two, three, four, five. I do eight points. So if I label them as A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H, if you had to pick one of them, and again, this is only by eye, so it's not going to be perfect, but if you had to pick one of them to be the exact point where the graph changes from looking like a hill to looking like a bowl, which point? E? e? Is that the general consensus, or do uh, are, uh, others disagree? G. I say A. A? A? I mean, like D. Oh, wait, hold on. How can it be A? It's certainly a hill the entire time. How can wait, wait, wait? Where, I don't know who said A, so I'm not, I'm not <laughs> in any way. But it's certainly a hill, at least to C. At least to C, it certainly is still like a hill. And in terms of a bowl, it's got to be a bowl at least till F. So the the changing point. It has to be somewhere in that area. Do we see that? Do we agree? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll go for either D or E. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are just approximations anyways. If I had to give it a guess, I'd say somewhere around there, give or take. Does that seem relatively reasonable? Yeah. So this distance from the center to that point, this is one standard deviation. Now, for those of you who have had calculus, what do I call this point? Uh, 
Wouldn't that, isn't that the third derivative point? No. Um, instantaneous change of a... No, it's called something. It's called the point of something. Oh, inflection. Point of inflection. And there is a very specific mathematical technique for calculating it, which we're not going to do because this is not a calculus-based course. But even though we did it by eye, just be assured that there is a way of figuring out exactly the right spot. And that point is called the point of inflection, which is not a term that you need in this course, but it's good to have a name for it. The point of inflection is where the graph changes from looking more like a hill to looking more like a bowl. Where it looks like a hill, we call it concave down. And when it looks like a bowl, we call it concave up. So the point of inflection is where it changes from being concave down to concave up. Now, next question, follow-up question. I know that the total area under the curve is one. If I don't look at the total area under the curve, but rather I only look at the part up until one sigma in both directions, what is the area approximately of the yellow part? And remember again, the total area for the whole curve must be one, otherwise it's not even a distribution. 68%. Okay, so you already know the answer, don't you? All right, so you cheated, okay? You're a cheater, but it is 68%, okay? So 68% of the data, not the data, sorry, 68% of the area is between the mean minus the deviation and the mean plus the standard deviation. And it should be approximately 68% because even that's not exact, it's approximately 68. And again, you know how we calculate that? Calculus. Oh, with calculus, that's right. So can't do it without it. Now, and if you already know the answer, please don't say anything. But if I decide to go two sigmas in both directions, and calculate the total area from two sigma to the left to two sigma to the right. Can anyone venture a guess as to what percentage, what area that would be? Is it 99.7? Okay, so to, if you're guessing that, that means you already knew the answer, even though this is not correct, by the way. But if you're guessing specifically 99.7, that means that you've seen it before, right? Yes. That's, that's too exact of an answer, right? <laughs> so it's not 99.7 though. It's not, it's not that, it's something else. But again, if, if you've seen it before, again, don't say anything. This is for people to guess who have never seen it before. So can anyone guess as to what the area is between two sigma to the left and two sigma to the right. I was guessing 99%. Okay, so it's not 99, but again, that's pretty close. It's actually 95%. 95% of the area is between mu minus two sigma and mu plus two sigma. And because it's already been given, 99.7% of the area is between mu minus three sigma and mu plus three sigma. Now, these three things, this rule actually has a name in statistics. The name, it's very, very confusing. It's like, I don't get that name. How does that name apply to this at all? This is called, and that was a joke by the way, because it's very obvious. This is called the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Okay, the 68, 95, 99.7 rule says that for a normal distribution, 
68% of the area is one sigma away from the mean. 95% of the area is two sigma from the mean or within two sigmas from the mean. And 99.7% is within three sigmas from the mean. This is the 68, 95, and 99.7 rule. Do we all understand why it has this name? Yes. It seems fairly reasonable, correct? Correct. So let's do an example. Let's do an example. Anyone know what IQ scores are? Um, uh, what the what the mean of an IQ score is? One hundred. One hundred. So IQ scores are approximately normal. Nothing's exactly normal because normal goes forever in both directions, and IQ scores don't. Um, but even if they did, nothing's exactly normal. It's just a model that we use to describe IQ scores with a mean of 100. And does anyone know the uh, standard deviation for IQ scores? Anyone happen to know this offhand? Fifteen. Okay. So question. What percent of people have IQ scores between, and we're going to start easy, between 85 and 115. Now, do not answer this question until I ask you to put it in chat so I can see everyone's answers at one time. Please don't just answer it. I want you all to think about it. Think about it. And the question is, what percent of people have IQ scores between 85 and 150? And someone threw an answer, even though I asked not to. Mm. That's okay. I forgive you. I'm in a forgiving mood. I might even think if it's correct or not. Maybe it's right. Maybe it's wrong. But please don't put the answers in until I call for it, because I want everyone to have the opportunity. So I'm going to give you 10 more seconds to think about it. Five. Go right now, everyone. So everyone's saying 68. Uh, those, those six, one, two, three, four, five, seven people who answered. Anyone have, oh, I saw some other answers. 53, I see 70, I see a couple 70s. Any other ones? Another 68. 72, 70. All right, good. People are going to learn something today. So the, oh, some more 70s. So the answer is 68%, but I'm curious where these other numbers are coming from. Where is 70 coming from? Okay, so um, I put 53 and I just thought we were supposed to like guess random numbers. I didn't, yeah, sorry. I, I forgive you, there's no guessing here. This, is, this, this we can calculate. This is an exact answer. Or okay. Yeah. An answer. So where are these 70s coming from? A lot of 70s, but I don't know where it's coming from. Someone help me. 70, 70, 70, 70. I see a lot of 70s, five seventies. Why 70s? Um, I guess, but it was just the same thing. Like I thought we were just throwing out numbers and I just didn't think that many people can be kind of dumb, but I guess I was wrong. You'd be surprised at how many people can be kind of dumb. 
I'm, I'm one of those, yeah. Oh, I'm one of them too. Trust me. Trust me. I am a dumb person. I might be good at math, but I am a dumb person overall. Trust me about that one. So in this case, we have a normal curve that is centered at what number? What is the peak value? But what is the uh, mean of this distribution? 100. 100. If I go one sigma to the left and one sigma to the right, where do, what two numbers do I end up at? 800, uh, 85 and 115. And according to the 68, 95, 99.7 rule, what percent of the area is between 85 and 115? 68. And therefore, what percent of people are going to score between 85 and 115? 68. 68 percent. Follow-up question. What percent of people score less than 115? And again, calculate this. It's not a guessing thing. There's an actual answer. Calculate it. Try to calculate it. But please do not type it in until I call for it. I'll give you a few more seconds. Five, four, three, Two, one, go. Ooh, some 84s, four 84s in a row. Any other ones? And I also like to see, I don't know. That way I know that you're actually trying, even if you don't get it, I'm okay with that. But if I just see like, you know, for example, all the right answers, and then I'll just like, hey, wow, everyone got this. We can move on. And all the people who are suffering in silence. And if you don't want to say publicly, you don't know, send me a direct message you don't know. That's, that's fine too. But all the people who answered every single one of them, one, two, three, 83.85. Oh, I think you might've used a calculator, but no, even a calculator wouldn't give you that. Where did I, okay, good, we got a no idea, love it. Where did 83.85 come from? That's not correct, but I'm curious. Where uh, you um, so what I did was I just subtract um, 68 minus the 99.7 rule and then the, to find like the deviation past uh, 115. Oh, I should have done, I should have done 95 actually, cause it's too. I'm just trying to find the deviation to the left of 85. So I divided it by two, but I think I used the wrong one. Well, I don't understand what you mean by that. Uh, 80, uh, 85 is one deviation to the left, right? Yeah, I was trying to find the deviation to the left. So basically what I did was I subtract 99.7 minus 68. No, 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 no. And, no, and no. then I divided by two. Yeah, you can't do that. That doesn't, okay, then. and 99.7 is three deviations. 68 is one deviation. You, you can't be subtracting those percentages. That's not how you do it. Oh, I do have a couple of people who said no idea. I love it. So here's how we're going to do it. First question, what is the area of this portion right here? And by the way, the answer was 84%. So the majority of you got it correct. But what is the area of just the green shaded portion? 34. That's 34% because the yellow is 68. And by symmetry, it's exactly half of that, correct? So that's 34%, right? 
Yes? Yes. All right, well, next question. What is the area of the entire left half of the whole bell curve? 50. Well, it's exactly half of the curve, so that's 50%, right? Yes. So less than 115 is the blue shading plus the green shading, which is how much shading? 80 or 84%. Does that make sense? Uh oh. Lights how did you get That's how did you get 34 again? Um the yellow is 68%, correct? Right. And the green is half of that. Oh, okay. Thanks. You see that? Yeah, I see what you mean. All right. I just gotta turn the light on for here. Let me ask the next question and then I'll go turn the light on. What percent of people score between 85 and 130? All right, so again, don't, uh, don't shout it out. Just try to calculate it. What percent are between 85 and 130? I gotta get the lights. Okay, five, four, three, two, one, go. Uh oh, nobody's going. Okay, I have 181.5, a 71.75. Eighty-three point eight five, another eighty-four sixty. Wow, 83, that's awesome. Six answers all different, I love it. I love it. I mean, I, I love six correct answers more, but I love the fact that people are trying and getting different things. 93, okay. At least nobody said anything over 100, that would be, uh, that would be bad. 83. Another 83, another 83. I have not gotten any messages about not knowing it, but I also not seeing everyone respond. Another 83, 84.85. Any stragglers? So I did see the correct answer there. Let's figure it out. So we know the peak is what again? 100. 100. 
And if I go one deviation left, what do I get to? 85. 85. And if I go two deviations right, where do I get to? 130. 130, right? So we're looking for this area here, the area between 85 and 130. And there's various ways to get it, but they're all variations on the theme. So here's how I would do it. First, I would say, okay, I would say, well, if I go one, uh, let's move that over a little bit. If I go one deviation in both directions, which is in my horizontal lines here, if I go one deviation in both directions, what area is that? From here to here is what area? 68. That's 68%, correct? Now, if I go two deviations in both directions, what area is that? 95. That's 95%, correct? Yes. Let's break it down further. The 68%, if I take half of that, this, this half, what's that? 34. 34%. And if I take the 95 and just do this half of that, 47.5. 47.5. Do we agree? Yes. Well, of these numbers, which are the ones that I want to add together to get the right value? The 34 and the 47.5. That equals? 81.5. 81.5%. Now, most people didn't get that. So I am curious, especially the 83s, where that came from, because I saw a lot of 83s. So where did that 83s, the 83s come from? Um, I put 83.85, and I accidentally divided 99.7 by 2 instead of 95 by 2. So you had the right idea, just the wrong execution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. How about the rest of you? Where do those those numbers come from? So what I did, cause I put I, I put eighty three. So what I did was I added I added um thirty four plus thirty four, and then from there I got sixty eight, and then I just added like fifteen on the side, and I was like, oh, let me just add this random fifteen. Oh, so you just picked a random number? Yeah, again. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. So we want to avoid that. Uh, I mean, yes, there, there are certainly times that I might say, you know, approximate something, um, but. No, actually I got the 15 because, um, um, because we were already at 115 and we were going to 130 and I was like, oh, it's 15 more. So let me add those 15 on there. Oh, so no, so, so these, yeah. But according to that logic, wouldn't this also be 15 from 100 to 115? Yeah. Right. So that logic doesn't, doesn't carry over. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Anyone else? Um, or does anyone not understand how to calculate 81.5% of this one? There's a lot of normal distribution stuff in coming chapters. In fact, I would say pretty much 80% of the course from here on out is going to rely upon this stuff. So if you're not really getting this, you should speak up because it's not going to get any easier. Okay, so question, what percent, and we're not gonna answer this by the way, so you don't have to write this down. I mean, you can write it down as like notes, but don't try to answer it. What percent of the area is between 87 and 108? Why can we not answer this question? Because we don't actually have values. Right. We have no percentages other than precisely one deviation out, two deviations out, three deviations out. We have nothing else. And 87 and 108, they're 
They just fall in random places. Huh? Yes? So can't answer this yet. So how are we going to answer that? Well, sadly, there's only one way truly to answer that. And can anyone guess what you need for that? Calculus. 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 You need calculus. But luckily, luckily, people who knew calculus helped program your calculator so that your calculator can give us the answer even if you don't know calculus. So, does everyone have your calculator handy? If not, I am going to hold mine up so you can see what I'm doing. I will pin my screen and you can write these steps down. And um, if you have your calculator with us, you can, of course, follow along. If not, you can write these down uh, or um, watch this later. So the first thing you're going to do is turn the thing on. If it's not on already, turn it on. Does anyone have it with them? Am I the only one? Yes, okay. So take a guess as to the first button you're going to press. And hint, it's not stat. So look at every little nook and cranny of that calculator. Is, and is it second calc? It is not second calc. Okay. Look at every little nook and cranny, you know, and I'll hold it up for those of you who don't have it. So see if you can figure out, based upon what you see there, what we're going to press. Is it the second in the table, like last time? Second in table. What table do you see? Uh, it was to the right, I think, like the top right. No, no. Is it math? No. So, because my hand's hurting, I will tell you. It is second. And then that. What does that say? District or D-I-S-T-R. D-I-S-T-R. What do you think D-I-S-T-R stands for? Distribution. Distribution. And when you, when you get that, you get a, something that looks like this. Yes. Now, which one are we going to choose? Normal. That's what there's two normals. We're going to choose the second one, normal CDF. Normal CDF. And we're going to hit enter. And then what I have is something that looks like this. It asks for four things. Lower, upper, mu, sigma. Now, currently, what's my lower? Negative nine, nine. Negative nine 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 nine. In other words, negative infinity, way out there to the left. What's my upper? It's one fifteen. One fifteen for the particular case where my mu and my sigma are what? Uh, one hundred and fifteen. Okay. Well, didn't we do this problem above when I said what percent of people score less than one hundred fifteen? Wouldn't that be what this should calculate? The area less than 115? Yes. So our answer there is 84%. Let's see what our calculator gives us. Eighty-four point one three four four seven four zero four percent As I said, 84% is an approximation. Your calculator is still approximating, but it's a better approximation. Does that make sense? Yes. 
Everyone? Yeah. Everyone else? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So let's do the last one, which was 85 to 130. How would I compute that? What would I do? What percent of people score between 85 and 130? How would I compute that? Mm -hmm. On your calculator, how would I compute, huh? Would you put the min and maximum to the numbers? Lower 85, upper 130, the same mean and sigma. What should my answer be? Approximately, if we did it correct. What should I get? 0. 0.84. Oh, I thought we got 81.5%, didn't we? You have to press that to her one more time. Huh? Oh yeah, I haven't done it yet. I'm waiting for you guys to answer my question. What should we get? What did we get? We did it five minutes ago. What did we get? 81.5. So I hope I should get something around 81.5, right? Right. Do I? Um, no. Uh, 81.9, that's not bad. Oh, yeah. All right, 81.9, 81.85. 80.86, that's not bad at all. So your calculator can do any number. So when I asked what percent are between 87 and 108, how would I compute that? Just do the same thing again. Just do the same thing again. I already did it. And I got 51.00363041 percent. So while we can't do it by hand because we don't have nice sigmas, we can still do it on our calculator. Does that make sense what we did today? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We will do a whole other day of this next time because uh, chapter three is really important. Normal stuff really, really important. We're not quite done yet. I want to do one more thing only because um, I did it with my other class and I want us to be on the same page. Um, so first, calculators can do it. Yay. Okay. Uh, the TI-84 can do it real quick easily can do it real easily so that's why i recommend the ti-84 uh, other calculators can of course do it as well uh, crunch it stack crunch various uh, online programs can do it oh i'm not sharing my screen nobody said anything okay so let's go back and share calculator can do it yay the ti-84 can do it real easily okay um and then what we're gonna to start to do is start to talk about one normal curve that is better than all the rest. Oh, I'm gonna unpin, how do I unpin, remove pin? Okay, can you all see it when I'm sharing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the standard normal distribution. The standard normal distribution is a special normal. Every normal requires two numbers to uniquely determine it, correct? We spoke about this, right? Yes. Out of all the normals in the world, one of them is better than all the rest. It has a very specific mean and a very specific standard deviation. Now the mean is the center. So out of all possible centers that you can have mathematically, which one do you think would be the easiest to work with? Zero. Zero. And of all possible spreads, of all possible standard deviation values, and it can't be zero, of course, because then we don't have any spreads, so there's no curve. One. One. 
the standard normal distribution is the one whose mean is zero and whose standard deviation is one. And what's really nice is that no matter what distribution you start with, whatever normal you start with, you can always convert it to the standard normal distribution. And the, and the way we do that is the following formula. Z equals X minus mu over sigma. X is your raw data, whatever actual value you have. Mu is your uh, underlying mean, whatever mean you have. Sigma is your underlying STDEV. And Z is called your Z score. You translate your information that you have to a Z score. And by so doing, you change a um, normal into a standard normal. So let me give an example and we'll end with this. The heights of women aged 20 to 29 in the United States, heights of women. 20 to 29 is approximately normal with a mean of 64.2 inches and a standard deviation of 2.8 inches. This comes from some data somewhere. Is a 70 inch tall woman uh, considered, uh, what's a good word, considered um, normal? Well, I'm going to say abnormal, but I don't mean in a bad way. I just mean, is it is it weird enough that that would be a uh, an odd occurrence? Obviously, if someone was like 3,000 inches tall, you'd be like, that's crazy. Outlier. And uh, basically an outlier. Is a 70-inch tall woman considered an abnormal, considered an outlier? The rule of thumb, rule of thumb, anything outside two sigma is considered abnormal. Anything outside two sigmas is considered out abnormal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna compute her z-score. We take her raw data, which is 70. We subtract the mean, which is 64.2. And then we divide by the deviation, which is 2.8. So 70 minus 64.2 divided by 2.8. This gives us what value? 2.07. Yeah, approximately 2.07. What, what would you want us to approximate it to like usually? Uh, usually, usually two decimals is fine. Okay. So what does this tell us? This tells us that she is 2.07 standard deviations above the mean. She is... 2.07 sigma above mu. Is that abnormal by our definition? Yes. Yes. This is slightly abnormal. She's like just slightly beyond the boundary. But what we've done is we computed a value called the z-score, which tells us how many sigmas we are away from the mean. Because if I just say 70 without knowing, hey, 70 for IQ scores is really low. 70 for women's heights is really high. Obviously the raw data by itself is just not enough. I need more than that, right? So what the z-score calculates, it takes into account the actual mean, it takes into account the actual standard deviation and it says, 
this is how many sigmas you are above or below your mean without worrying about the specifics of the situation that you're dealing with. Mean, 64.2, don't care. Sigma, 2.8, don't care. Actual value, 70, don't care. All I care is how many sigmas you are above or beneath the mean. That's what the z-score gives me. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we'll do more of this next time. Uh, we'll end here, because now I'm on, on par with the other course. Um, are there any questions? Uh, so no. for the TI, um, is the 83 and the 84 basically the same or is it I mean, like a little different? It's, it's different enough that I can't tell you how to do things on the 83, but it's similar enough that I think everything that you can do on the 84, you can do on the 83. Okay, then. I just I, want to know how big of a difference. Yeah, I just don't know how to do it. But okay, then. the 84 was, they definitely made things easier to use. Okay. Okay. On on the days that we have like exams, like when we have to go to school and take the exam, are we gonna be able to use our calculator? Yes. Okay. Um. So I have a TI Inspire CX. Would I be able to use that? Uh, is that a TI Inspire? Yeah. There you go. I think so. I don't see why not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Cool. I mean, I'll have to probably you know um put it in test mode because okay. you know. You can program things on there, but I don't see why not. Okay, cool. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to pause the recording and or stop.